Hi, this is Carl Palachuk. Welcome to another SMB Community Podcast. I'm joined today by Maz Malik, who is the VP of Sales and Marketing for Vertient, and uh, they are found at vertient.com. Welcome, sir. Well, thank you, Carl, for the opportunity to be able to talk to you and, and your community. So uh, just a note for regular viewers that uh, I'm obviously not at home. I'm in a uh, hotel in Chicago, and uh, Maz asked me, so what do we do here? And I said, I just ask whatever comes to my mind. And he said, oh, this isn't going to be good because I just always say whatever comes to my mind. <laughs> so it makes two of us. Half, half hour. <laughs> so, so let's, I guess, start with the basics. Um, uh, what is Verdient and uh, why should I care? Right. Well, Verdient is a disaster recovery as a service company. So we basically uh, take the customer's production environment, uh, their networking, their virtualization environment, and we basically replicate that into the cloud. So in case something happens uh, on the customer's premises, the servers are not available or the services that you're offering the customers are not available, then Vertian takes over and makes those services available to the end customer uh, so that the business carries on uh, working as it should. So there's very little or to no downtime uh, and the services are basically uh, open working as uh, quick as they could. All right. So, of course, everyone is thinking this sounds like a BDR, but, but BDRs don't describe themselves as disaster recovery yes. as a service. Yes. So what's, what is different? Well, what I'll do is, is I'll give you a, a, a bit of a history and just to put some context to it. We originally launched the product as a HCI product, a hyperconverged infrastructure product. And once we looked into the market, how we could make use of that technology that we had for hyperconvergence, one of the things that we came across uh, with a number of our customers was that uh, this would be an ideal solution for disaster recovery because hyperconvergence gives you that compute, that run capability, uh, and that storage capability all combined into one package. So once we started looking, looking more into that sort of market space and the products that were out there, we came across uh, what you uh, might describe as BCDR type products, which were basically uh, started life as backup products. Uh, now, right. I'm old enough to know, you know, 25, 30 years ago, we were, we were backing up onto tapes and then eventually the magic came about, hard drives and NAS boxes, then we backed up onto those. And a lot of the disaster recovery products you see out in the market, they're basically backup products with a plus plus sign uh, attached to them. And those inherently, because of their background, have um, a lot of uh, baggage that they need to carry forward. So once we were looking at the uh, disaster recovery market, we kind of thought to ourselves, why is it that we still need to have this baggage from 20 years ago, which is the backup, uh, and why do we still need to carry it forward for the disaster recovery? So you mean by that, a, a standard BDR is a box that sits next to my server, it copies the server, yes. then it puts it up in the uh, cloud. That's Some right. variation of that. That's right? right. And it syncs it up. And some of the issues that we found there were, you, you, again, that was very much the way the technology was put forward 10, 15 years ago. And why is it that the disaster recovery still kind of relies on you having an appliance on site? Uh, remember, this is supposed to be cloud and it's all supposed to be up there in, in the great ether. Why is it that as a partner or a customer, you still need to purchase a box uh, and then plug it in? Perhaps it takes a week for that box to be delivered and then you need to reconfigure it. And once you've backed up onto it, it then replicates itself um, out onto the cloud. And then when you need some services from it, you're kind of somewhere in the middle of it being on the box or it being up, up in the cloud. Uh, and then because most of the companies out there come from this uh, backup uh, type situation is that they've tried to add the cloud as an afterthought. It's something that needs to be um, taken care of in a semi-separate situation from the box, which is what they specialize in. 
so once we looked at that market, um, we decided we're going to be um, a pure cloud DR solution that doesn't have some of the baggage that the existing backup companies do. So you install an agent on a server and then just replicate to a cloud environment from there? That's, that's right. So if you can imagine in the cloud, we have disaster recovery, our technology that's in the cloud. And on the customer premises, we put a very small agent that goes into their VMware environment. And that agent connects that VMware infrastructure into the cloud. And once you're connected into the cloud, we directly take the data from your VMware and we put it directly into the cloud. Within that agent, we have our own one optimization type technology, which uh, helps limit the amount of bandwidth that needs to be uh, absorbed uh, by the customer. But amazingly, we don't see from our customers any sort of complaints about the bandwidth. Because imagine the first iteration that you take, that takes a while to get that data up right. and out. And from there onwards, we're only taking the changes. And then once we've taken the changes, we're compressing and caching those changes within our agent. So again, we're reducing that data amount down, and then we're basically putting that up to the cloud. And once it's in the cloud, that's basically really where our magic really comes in from the technology. Uh, because a number of the um, uh, vendors out there, because it's an add-on, and they rely very heavily on the box and its, and its capability. Uh, and once they try to get into the cloud, a number of um, issues that have arisen with customers uh, that basically said is, is once they've put their, let's say you're running an ERP system on your production environment, they bring it into the cloud, but because generally, for example, terminal services, ERP systems require a lot of resource. They require a certain amount of RAM, they require a certain amount of CPU, a certain amount of horsepower to run. Once they try to get it into the cloud, being able to run in the cloud with those sort of resources uh, becomes an issue. So you look at our competitors like, for example, Dato or uh, Unitrend, they will allow you to copy as much data as you like into the cloud. But once you get there and you try to run it, they then try to restrict you on the amount of RAM that you can have, the number of CPUs can have. Right. So we've had customers, so for example, I remember one particular customer uh, based on the East Coast, they have a quite a large ERP system, it requires uh, 128 gigs of RAM uh, plus some others. So basically they requires about 196 gigs of RAM. When they, they were currently running with another um, disaster recovery company, and as they put it into the cloud, once they got there, it was great. But once they try to run it in the cloud, that vendor then put right. from it. So that makes perfect sense. So, so if somebody else has got a just this tiny little machine, it barely runs. So what do you guys do? You spin it up on just a much bigger machine, or you just spin it up on as big a machine as you need? As big a machine as we need, depending on because we've spoken to the customer, we know. Uh, for example, you have customers that might be backing up 50 machines into our cloud, but they say, mm, actually, when a disaster happens, we don't need all 50 of them up and running. We need five of them up and running. We need 10 of them right. up and running. And from that, we can gauge the current CPU that you're using on site, the amount, current amount of RAM that they're using in production now, and we dedicate that for the customer so that when they actually come to run those machines on the cloud, whether it's 196 gigs of RAM, 256 gigs of RAM, or four gigs of RAM, we have already planned for that to be up and working, and it's reserved for that customer. So when, if they try to fire up all these machines that require half a terabyte of RAM, they will fire up within two to three minutes. Right. Um, it doesn't need to have any more extra configuration or you don't need to ring us up. All of these are very much designed for the small and medium sized enterprises. And, with, and that has issues in itself, the amount of expertise that might be on site or that my expertise might be on site but is not available at that time when the disaster happens at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so the, all our solutions is designed to be either run by the customer or by the partner. And of course, we're always there 24 seven for you to back on to us. And do you sell direct or only through partners? We only sell through the channel. So, through the channel. Channel. Okay, good. so um, when, uh, 
it was somebody has already got a virtual system. I assume you can just work with that as well if they're on OneDrive or they're um, uh, yeah. Amazon Web Services or something. Yeah, so, so, so um, we work on VMware. Okay, so if the customer has VMware, whether it's sitting on their premise or it's sitting in a data center, long as we can connect into their vCenter, we can take the entirety of whatever that vCenter is controlling and basically turn it into our disaster recovery as a service platform uh, service that we can then deliver to them. Uh, we have some customers that just basically um, have a small uh, VMware type environment shop, uh, like for example, a couple of manufacturing companies that, that we have quite small in their nature. And then we have customers that have multiple VMware and vCenters that we can then connect into. They're still treated as one customer, but you know, for example, they might have multiple branches or for um, production and testing they might have uh, different vCenters so we can take all of those and the key aspect for us is, is we don't just try to replicate their um, VMs into the cloud we take the entire infrastructure into into consideration so they might have routers they might have VLANs they might have access control policies, and the key that we try to make as a disaster recovery as a service is that we replicate your current infrastructure on site into the cloud. So we don't just take a single VM from, from your infrastructure and try to just put it out there in the ether and then say, well, trying to access it is your problem. You know, <laughs> we, we've done our bit. We've, we've, we've taken your VM, we made it available within five minutes, but that doesn't make the business being able to make use of it. Right. The business to come back online. So we have some fancy technology like layer two VPN networking and, and we can give you external IP addresses uh, so that you can come in from, for example, if something happens on site, you can come in from. Right. So uh, if something happens, you mentioned three o'clock in the morning. So let's say it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm not on site. My customers are not on site, but somehow you determine that there's an event and you need to bring that thing uh, live in the cloud. Yes. Uh, how does how does that happen? Kind of step, uh, not not too much detail, but you know what I mean. You know what's the big picture? Right. Right. So um, we let the customer decide when a failover event needs to happen because the customer is more aware of what their internal infrastructure looks like and what has actually failed and what that needs to be. Um, um, being brought up alive in the DR as a service platform. So the uh, swap over point is always the final decision is on the customer to decide if this uh, service needs to be uh, made available uh, across the DR. So whether they want to do it themselves, they uh, want to ring up the partner or in in most cases, they at three o'clock in the morning, they will basically uh, ring up our uh, knock and one of our engineers would help them bring it up. If, uh, for example, some of our customers are quite savvy in the technology aspect, the system is designed as self-service, very simple and very straightforward. So you can imagine for a small business or a, or a small medium-sized enterprise, we try to not to talk to them at a very heavy technical level about NFS or iSCSI. No, no, no. What we try to do is this is nice, pretty picture, dashboard, uh, and basically, you hit the play button on the machine that you wanted to bring up, up in the cloud, and then we basically, that happens uh, at that stage. It doesn't require any interaction from us. But you can imagine disasters don't happen every day. People are unsure, shall I hit the play button or not? And they just need some holding. They just need some comfort factor. And in that case, uh, our technical people are available uh, to ring up and just either help you through that or basically take over the entire process and, and make that happen generally less than five minutes so with i'm assuming this is real-time imaging yes yeah. okay so what happens if there's ransomware like i i choose to go someplace and infect my system and i choose <laughs> i choose to say yes to yes. the ransomware opportunity and now uh it's encrypting everything so how do you how do you deal with that yeah, we actually had a customer that had a very similar problem. Um, they received an email from one of their suppliers um, and somebody opened it up, um, one of the users, and then it locked up uh, a number of the machines. Uh, so um, 
uh, when you look at our platform, the platform gives you a number of options. So, for example, let's say uh, you've decided that you want to uh, replicate this machine uh, every 15 minutes, every half an hour, one hour, three hours, five hours. As you go back into our recovery platform, it gives you those, for a better word, better snapshots. So there might be 200 snapshots within that single machine or 500 snapshots or 20 snapshots, depending on, on your schedule. And what you're able to do is, is, is click on that uh, snapshot and say, I want to bring this one alive. And when I say click on it, it literally is. It gives you dates and times, you click on it and hit the play button and it becomes alive. So we've, we've had this particular scenario that you described happen at a, at a customer uh, premises and the IT manager basically took care of it himself. So you basically go back to the version before the ransomware. <laughs> Indeed. And, uh, you, and at some stage, you might be, again, in a real world situation, you don't know which version is the one that has the issue. Right. And the way that our system is sandboxed, it allows you to bring a machine up, it allows you to verify, hmm, is this the right one or not? And then decide, okay, I want to make this particular one live. So I can view them without making them live. Correct. Correct. Right. You can view them, you can change their data, you can run tests against them. So we have customers, a number of customers that just use it as a uh, nothing more than a uh, testing sandbox environment. So for example, you're running an ERP system, the ERP company comes to you and says, we've got some updates. Would you like to take the risk of putting it on the live system? Or would you like to have a snapshot from three hours ago? run the update against that, even simple service packs in Windows. Run that against that. Does that have any effect? Does it deteriorate any of my services? Once you convince yourself that is the case, then you can run it up against your live system. So it's very, cool. very flexible in the way that it works. So uh, you sound like you might not just be from Chicago. So where are, where, where are you located? Where's the company located? Okay, I'm, I'm personally from the United Kingdom. So okay, you, that's what I thought. <laughs> I've had a few people say it's a router, not a router. It's so, a router, um, exactly. <laughs> a tomato, not a tomato. So um, we're based here in uh, Silicon Valley uh, in California uh, around, the, around the Bay Area. Uh, and we have customers uh, all over the U.S., uh, we have data centers uh, spread out that, that deal with this. Um, so we're a, a US-centric uh, company. All right, so all the data centers are in the US? That, that's right, for the US, they're in the US. Yes. Okay, like I say, so I'm what if, if folks are in Canada uh, or uh, other places where they don't want their data to go overseas? Uh, correct, yeah, so all of our data in the US stays in, in the US. Um, and as I say, I'm from across the pond, so we have infrastructure that's out in, um, out in Europe as well. Uh, but just for the US, most of our customers, if, you, if a customer requests that, you know, we'd like to put our data in, in Europe or out in Asia as in Singapore, then we can also, um, we can also uh, take care of that. But for the US, we're US and Right. So, because we also have folks uh, who are in uh, Australia and obviously the UK and in other places. So, um, so you can put the data wherever you need to. Yes, yes, wherever is appropriate. Obviously, we try to put it to the closest data center. It has the performance <laughs> issues and all those sort of good things that we can uh, better control. Uh, but if there's a need that, yeah, we'd like to move our data, um, our copies of data. For, as you can imagine, we're a DR company, so we back up our own data. <laughs> it would right. make sense to offer <laughs> customers services that we then then uh, we eat our own dog food and we move our data around. And if uh, a customer wishes that data to be, um, you know, taken across the pond, then uh, not an issue. So, so I'm just prepping a, uh, a seminar with Channel Pro, and and it's about how why people need disaster recovery, why people need all this stuff. And one of the slides is about you know, hey. It's not, it's not always the bad guys you have to worry about. A lot of times, it's just your employees who do stupid stuff. Uh, you know, they, maybe somebody corrupted a database. Somebody dragged stuff and dropped it and doesn't know where it is now. Uh, so is it, 
are you reasonably priced enough to make it worthwhile for somebody to protect themselves from their own employees? <laughs> very, very much so. And as has, that's why if, if Bank of England came to us and says, we want to run these services of Bank of America uh, here, then we, uh, we would happily move them on and say, this is, this is not, the, not the service for you. We're very much designed uh, for the small business, medium sized uh, company, whether it's from the financial aspect or whether it's from the technological aspect. You know, we, we realize that we don't all have VMware experts sitting there. We don't have storage experts. We don't have Cisco engineers sitting there waiting for something to go wrong. So um, for all of those, we're very much into the small business. And, and the key aspect that you uh, uh, touched on there is what is a disaster? Uh, and generally, people think uh, here would be hurricanes and earthquakes and all those sort of good things. But on a day-to-day -day basis, what we see more of is the accidents that, uh, that do happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Some of them by your own staff, some of them by just the fact that the environment that we live in. Like I said with the previous um, customer, um, one of their suppliers, um, one of their users sent one of its customers, uh, uh, an email, uh, a user on site, double clicked it. And next thing you know, uh, the PC that they were running on, terminal services they were running on, that locked up and it then locked up the database and it just kind of went through the system. Um, and yeah, the other side of that is obviously the, the larger things will happen. You need to keep your data away from your production environment. So you need to have some sort of an air gap between where the real data is, the production data. And in the olden days, as I said, you know, you probably see from my uh, few white hairs that uh, in the olden <laughs> days, you used to take tapes to the bank. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You used to take tapes to the bank or you threw them at the back of your car and took them home. And well, the modern equivalent of that is even if you feel like you're well protected within the production environment cells, the uh, company building then it never hurts to have your data just an air gap away from where you are. Uh, and we cater for both what we call 100% um, disaster, i.e. the entire building is not available, or partial disasters, like you're running 10 virtual machines, one of the virtual machines goes down for whatever reason, and you want to run nine of them from production in your main company, but the last one you want to run it from the cloud but as far as the end user interaction is concerned you want to make sure that those end users never know that an issue has happened or that they need to be offline and that's where I think Vertient really has uh, the 360 degree solution in that whether the solution is running partially from the cloud or 100% from the cloud the end user does not need to make any changes on the PC Right. And once you try to recover that solution back, you don't need to tell the end user you need to switch off, which is, again, if a disaster recovery solution says, OK, you need to disconnect all your users because we need to move the data back. OK, that's a backup solution, because given enough time, any backup solution can recover for you. But the key aspect here is time. How long, if you have 50 users sitting there inputting things, how long can you have them offline while you kind of try to solve the disaster that time. Right, so um, if assuming something fails over to the cloud, uh, some BDR companies say, well, you can spend a little time there. Some say, hey, you can spend, you can leave it up there for all we care. Where, where do you fall on, on that if I fail over to your cloud? Yeah, um, officially we allow you two months. Uh, to run in our data center, which is more, we've never got to the sort of the stage that, you know, people need to run that, that amount of time there. You know, disaster happens, for example, the servers fail, the virtual machine has failed, uh, you switch over to our environment, it runs there, the users still carry on working, you as the IT person or, or the um, MSP solve the problem on site, uh, and now you want to bring the data back. But generally we say uh, two months, but again, you can imagine if a, if a hurricane has gone through um, a particular area, at two months, we're not going to say to you, okay, that's it. Yeah, so, yeah. To, you hey, know. Hey, you're in Puerto Rico, sorry, you got to take yes, it. Yes, it's taken six months for you to, uh, so we've, we've, we've never found ourselves in that situation and, and I can't imagine that we will, we'll, you know. All right, so uh, do you have anybody who uses your service just basically to 
uh, migrate to a new uh, environment and then you continue to use you as the BDR? Exactly. So we've had customers that basically, that let's say they want to change over their servers, the new hardware is coming along, or they want to put um, the system on a, um, a test type environment. So they would basically put us, uh, declare a, um, a disaster, move the services into the cloud, maybe it takes couple of days a week and then basically move those back and this is again one of our key benefits is that when you migrate back from a disaster situation back you don't need to switch off your production users you don't need to say to them okay go home now and don't come back for two days while we migrate this tons of data back because our system has a hot migration facility so the end customers carry on using the service in the cloud right until the last minute and in the background we're put, taking that data and we're bringing it back to your production environment whether that takes five minutes, one hour, one day, or a week, it doesn't matter because your live users are still working in our environment. And we've had a number of customers that, well, I want to change out this server. That's my critical VM. I don't want to migrate it internally. Okay, can we run it on your system? Yeah, plenty of resources. You've paid for it. Please make use of it. And again, uh, all of that is transparent to the end user you don't we don't ask you to change your dns entries and mx mail entries and all that. no so because you manage all that we uh, our system is designed not to interfere with that service because we know changing a server moving it around is quite a simple task for us but when you say i've got 50 users some of them might be at home some of them might be in a different department okay you as the it manager or msp has to go around all 50 trying to change their configuration for this what might be a disaster for one week or one hour is unrealistic, especially in smaller companies where perhaps the technical expertise might not be available when it's needed. All right. So we're almost out of time, but we're going to put your website down below. And uh, I guess the final question is, uh, so are you compliant with all of the HIPAA and GDPR and all that, all, all this coming things, privacy yeah. legislation that's uh, going wild, including in California where you are? In, indeed. So um, most of my expertise is from the ISO standards because those are the ones that we use um, uh, back across, across the pond. But all of that, yes, is taken care of. Yeah. And again, that's something that we try and uh, alleviate from the SMB market space because you have to then prove uh, if you have compliance issues and uh, it's not an issue that we, 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 uh, um, that we fall down on. Right. And uh, is the, does the data move from me to you? Is it encrypted or is it? Uh... Indeed, of course. So as, as part of that compliance, the data is uh, encrypted as it moves and as it rests on our servers. So even our own teams don't have um, application level access to that data. Uh, we obviously are able to move it around, but it's in a state that is it's encrypted and it's safe. Uh, as you can imagine, as a, uh, as a cloud service company, it's something that we need to comply with. Local well, as I imagine, you should. That doesn't necessarily mean everybody does. <laughs> well, I hope they do. <laughs> I hope they do, but... Yes, yeah, yeah. We, there's this big thing that. called reality out there that doesn't always uh, behave the way you would like it to. Indeed. So, all righty. Uh, anything else you want to say before we go? Yeah, uh, I would say I know uh, this has been very informative uh, that we've tried to put as much information across as we could. Uh, but I would recommend to people is uh, come over and have a demonstration of our technology. Uh, whether you're technical or you're looking at this from a business perspective, um, book a demo with our salespeople uh, and our technical people and they will take you through. We've covered a lot here and there's a, a lot more that the product is able to do. Is book a demo, it'll take half an hour to 45 minutes um, and hopefully it will give you a much better uh, understanding of what it can do for you as a business and that's the key for us is we're very focused on the small to medium-sized companies um, rather than the larger enterprises and for those we know there's challenges so even if you're a small company actually your data your ERP system whatever the sales prospect software that you're using is very important to you 
And that might be the only application that you're running. And as soon as that application stops working, your business stops. As opposed to larger companies which have a lot of users, but they also have a lot of different applications. A small part of the business might come to a halt for X number of hours. But in a small and medium sized companies, what we find is, is that particular application is key to that business. As soon as that stops, the money earning side of that business also stops. Right. Uh, and those are the sort of things that we concentrate on more. That's why we try to take away the technological aspect of this. You can make technology do anything that you want it to do. It's whether does it fit a business goal? Does it fit a business need? And especially if you're in that sort of mid-market uh, type situation where you might not have all the magical expertise that the larger companies can, can conjure together. Very good. All right, Maz Malik from uh, Verdian.com. Thank you for being with us today. And with luck, we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Uh